And what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Designated Players and MLS podcast. We're back again with another installment of what I'm going to call this week's MLS news, because I can't think of a better name for it. Uh, but we've got lots to cover, right? First, we're going to ch- we're going to talk about this CONCACAF Champions Cup attendance problem. Why is it? Why is nobody showing up? And how are we going to fix it? Or how could we fix it, right? We, we can't do anything about it, but then... We've got a rumored DP signing in San Jose in one Carlos Vela. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk how it shakes shakes up the conference and what we think of the move in general. Is it going to work? Do they change formation? All that and more. Finally, we're one game into the season, which means it's time to give our way too early coaches on the hot seat prediction. I'm Andrew. Over there is Connor. And it's time to dive into the biggest stories from this past week in MLS. Connor, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. That's it. You're That's all it. full. Of whatever, whatever lunch you you delayed this recording for. Yeah, it was a very worthwhile lunch. Huh? Worthwhile to not talk to me. That's there's no, nothing. That, those that's are my worth favorite activities. Much. There's nothing that's worth that much. But <laughs> listen, we got a lot to talk about today. So we, I, I'm going to yell at you offline. But we got a lot to talk about. Um, you know. I was watching a lot of CONCACAF Champions League this week and it, it shocked me and I've got numbers that might shock you, but what's going to shock everybody is whatever scarf you're wearing this week. And I know it's not actually going to shock them because you've worn it about nine times already, but. Well, like, yeah. I mean, what do you expect? We've been talking a lot about them lately. What do you want me to do? About who Connor? About who are we talking, talking about? We've been talking about the quakes a lot. And we're going to, I think it's, I love the upside down scarf. man. It that's looks all right. Great. That's all right. That's because they're turning the conference upside down with this new signing. <laughs> hey, this come story. on. Huh? That's it. You missed again. Stop getting distracted. We're recording. I, I hate everything about fantasy. If you play fantasy, in our league, I'm sorry. We're not playing anymore. It's been canceled. I'm playing. I was like fourth after last week. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, we're talking CCC, and it mainly came up as a problem with Nashville. So I've broken out my my favorite Nashville scarf, which is my only Nashville scarf, but one of my favorites in the collection. Very detailed. We've talked about it many a times. Let's just jump right into to this whole thing, right? CONCACAF Champions Cup attendance or Champions League. The only team that has failed to advance so far, Vancouver versus Tigres and St. Louis, who played Houston. So we're always going to lose at least one, but we've only lost two of the eight that we had in there, which is pretty good. While the sides were playing in what around the world is dreamed of, you know, international competition, the attendance numbers for these home matches were extremely poor. Across the eight home matches that MLS teams played, according to ESPN, They average just over 10,000 fans each being buoyed by Philadelphia, St. Louis, and FCC. Five of those eight matches fell to even get over 7,000 fans. And the the other two, or the other three, excuse me, broke, uh, one broke 20, the other two broke 15. So they were able to bring that up a little bit. But what do you think are the reasons behind this? I've got my ideas, but I want to hear yours. I mean, I think the obvious is a Wednesday night game, right? Like... If we're talking, you know, I don't exactly know the location of Geodis Park for Nashville, but I would imagine considering, you know, Nashville is a pretty large state. There's probably people that have to travel a decent distance in order to get to the stadium. And quite frankly, I don't think you're going to want to do that in the middle of a work week on a Wednesday. I'm trying to find the time when they played. It looks like it might have been 615, but I can't tell if that's central time eastern time i don't remember what time zone nashville's in maybe i could find it really quick i have it i I was gonna get to it later but they're an hour behind okay so that's like i mean still it doesn't matter like 6 15 right like people i think most people probably work generally nine to five so you're asking people to get off of work at five o'clock forget all your errands and everything because you probably have to go back home to change get in the clothes and then drive all the way back out to the stadium in order to see the game. Like you have an hour and 15 minutes to do that before the game starts. And I, I, this is my best guess as to when the time starts. It looks I'm going based off of like a Google preview 
from like a Nashville article from their site. So it's a good source, but I just don't know for sure. Like I can't find anything that says outright, but someone could correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's going to have a big influence. I mean, middle of the week, 615 is super early. Like I almost feel like they'd be better off if the game was at like eight or seven, like give people some time to get back from work change. You know, like if they have errands, they need to run and give them time in order to get out to the stadium. There's probably people that have to drive like 30, 45 minutes easily in order to get to the stadium. And if you got to do the drive all the way back home and then drive all the way back to the stadium, like you're not, you're just not going to do it. You're not going to go. Um, I tried to look up what the weather was on that day too. Cause I mean, that's probably like not a huge factor, but it could be, it looks like possibly the weather was like the high was good. It looked like it was like a 73, but the low is a 35. So it could have been pretty chilly at the night as well. Figure that's probably not a major factor, but could be a factor as to people not coming. I mean, I'm rambling on a lot, but I think the main thing is just the midweek games are not going to attract as many people. Yeah, so that was kind of my big starting point, but I have a couple things as well. But um, all during the week, we know traditionally less fans in the week for all the things you just mentioned. Um, kickoff times were crazy. Houston Dynamo kicked off at 9.30 p.m. local time on a Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. Like Nashville going to finish at like midnight. Oh, I had a I had a an interview with the uh, Noodle Time that the day after, two days, yeah, the day after. And I was asking like, "Hey guys, do you uh do you happen to have my the the script for this thing?" And they were like, "Oh yeah, let me let me get it for you uh in, in you know, this morning. We just got home." And I never I never ended up getting it because they were they were so shot. Um Nashville, Philly, and New England all kicked off at eight fifteen local time as well. So again, considering the traffic to get into New England or, or Philly, uh, and as you mentioned, Nashville, you're, you're looking at Tuesday or Wednesday night kickoffs where you have to go to work the next day, and it, it's ending at midnight. Like that's just that's never going to happen, right? So yeah, it, you know those sorts of kickoffs are are mental. But the other thing that I, I have two other reasons that I, I kind of put around this whole lack of attendance and and these aren't excuses by the way like we're not saying like oh you know you should never expect this these are international competitions people you know and again i i don't like comparing things to europe they're two completely different things but people in europe will travel thousands of miles for an away day for their team for an international competition right like for us he and, and again different different stories different different uh, scenarios here but this is your home like this we're not talking about like oh they traveled away to to jamaica and they only got you know a thousand fans this is in your home stadium right so the the two other things that i have or i'll start with the first one is the marketing for this tournament is terrible like we talk about how bad the marketing was for u.s open cup and and, and all this stuff and I had a friend, the friend that I bring up all the time, right? The guy who's who's big Barca fan. He's trying to get into to um, Inter Miami. Who I'm sure he's having a great time watching this game right now. Um, and he, he, you know, he's trying to get into the league as much as he can. He texted me this weekend, and he goes, or this week, and he goes, "Why is MLS not playing this weekend or this week, like on Wednesday?" I'm like, dude, it's Champions League. He had no idea that the Champions League for this region was happening. And that's the reason why we weren't playing. Nobody, you know, the dude watches soccer 24 seven. He had no idea it was even happening. You know, you don't see ads on Apple TV or regular TV. You know, I think about it like the NFL, right. To, to bring a little bit more realistic comparison. When you play, when you're watching the NFL, you know, when all the other games are happening, right. There, there are constant ads. And and again, different sport because you have a lot more ad breaks, but constant advertisements for, when um, when other games are playing, even on the same day, right? Oh, you're in the one o'clock game. Well, here's what's coming up next in the 4.15 or the 8 p.m. or the whatever, right? And and I know Champions League is a tough thing to do that with, but even, you know, we're watching the first couple of weeks and you don't see any of them. Vancouver kicked off super early, right? They were one of the earlier teams and it was like, oh, great. MLS is playing tonight. Who knew about that? Nobody? Like half the fans didn't even. And that isn't going to be successful in marketing to the casual fans, right? The diehards are always going to be there. But 
the casual fans, the one who make up the majority of your fan base, those are the ones you're missing out if you're not marketing this properly, right? That's that's a huge miss. In my opinion. Yeah, I know. I don't disagree with you. I, I just feel like uh, CONCACAF Champions League just does not hold the same prestige regionally as Champions League does in Europe. Like, it's just... It's I just don't think it's viewed as uh, like on the same level. Like I think the hardcore fans and the teams I think care about it a lot. And when Seattle was you know the first one to win it in in the modern era, I'll say, um, I think it was a really big deal for a lot of people. But I think there's been a big influx of fans since that point, and I just don't like you said I, they don't market it super well. And I just don't, I, but I don't think they care to market it that well. Like, I, I don't know. I don't really know what it is. I just don't think people place too uh, enough importance on it. Like, this is our, it's essentially our ticket to be on a more global scale. Because winning this puts us in a into the, what is it? The club, club, the club world, world cup. cup. Yeah. Yep. So that's a great opportunity. I mean, not that so many people around the world care so much about the club world cup, but still it puts more eyes on you when you get to play in that competition and get a little bit more recognition around the world. But the way that it's like you said, marketed here, you would, <laughs> you would think that it's just to like win a free gift card at Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I, that definitely plays a part and that's why I don't like comparing it to like, Oh, you know, Europe does it this way because, Right when you when you're playing, especially like a uh, let's pick a random country, right? A Polish team gets into the Champions League and they get drawn with United, right? Or um, Inter Milan, right? Like those games when they come to town, it's almost like when they come over here, right? For um, for those those summer things, like everyone's like, oh my god, I need to see them. When Calvary FC and uh, you know from last year, like Violette, come around that doesn't like open up your eyes as a casual to be like, Oh, I need to go watch this team play. Like, Oh my goodness. You know? So that definitely has a draw into it as well. Um, you know, and, and I don't want to knock any of the other teams, but you know, that that's kind of that disparity that people I think are, are missing when they're like, Oh, everybody loves soccer here. It's like people enjoy soccer in the United States, but they usually enjoy the top teams when they come around. They're not, they're not bought into the, the, meaning of what the game is they're more just like oh these guys i i know they're good i want to watch them play yeah, so and, yeah. oh sorry oh, go ahead. Ahead. Nope, no that's no, no, it I, that's, no i was uh, actually going to transition so go ahead um i get yeah, I me mean, yeah to your point exactly like nashville's playing mocha who's a dominican republic team and it's not i mean not, it's not meant to be like any disrespect towards them but like that's not a team that's going to get people like like you said like oh my God, I, I have to go get tickets. Like I have to go see Nashville play against this team. Like, and you don't need the European teams to get that hype. Like some of the, if they're playing against some of the top teams in Liga MX, like that's definitely going to draw interest with if they're playing Tigres or Monterey or whoever, like that's going to draw interest more so than them playing against like a team from the Dominican Republic where their star players aren't even playing like no honey, no Sam Surridge, like, it's just not going to draw people in, especially when they already went and won three zero away. Like it was, pro it was pretty locked up at that point. Like it would take a historical collapse to have lost at that point. So I think there's like so many different factors that probably played into it and them not getting the attendance. I think if they Nashville's, I think in line to play Miami, right? So like I would expect attendance is going to skyrocket compared to the last round. Well, we're going to talk about that in a second because there's a massive problem with the Nashville Miami game. Uh, and it, and it stems from the final reason that these attendances are low to begin with. And that's that teams don't include these tickets in their season ticket, like packages. So if you make this, if you make this tournament and you want to go watch your team on a, on a Tuesday night play against, you know, let's say it's a Leon or a Tigres or, or a whatever you have to pay extra on top of it. So it's either, you're, plan you're paying extra on top of 
a season ticket package you've already purchased, which depending on how many seats you've got can run you a couple thousand dollars. And now they're going to charge you the extra 60, 70, whatever for these tickets to go for a, a random Tuesday night versus Mocha. Right. Or it's just an unexpected out of pocket expense on the day. Right. If you're, um, you know, let, let's talk about like a fan that maybe is, not like a, a bought in hundred percent like season ticket every single uh you know game type of guy, but will go whenever he can or she can right and he wants to bring or she wants to bring a friend and the friend's kid right so I want to bring three people there you're gonna have to shell out an extra you know hundred fifty two hundred bucks to go to this game like that's not something you like can just put a lot of people can't just walk up and here you go right that's that's tough for some people so not having it involved like packaged together where at least in the first round where you're like, Hey, you want to be a season ticket holder and we just qualify for this. Even if you're going to, th- you know, op- you know, bring that season ticket price up an extra couple, couple bucks. And, and, you know, again, I don't know what that would really work out to be. I've never bought season tickets before, but if that's what you're considering on doing now, you're going to get people showing up for these games and that's massive. Right. So, that is, that is, I think, one of the biggest issues is the fact that it's an extra purchase. It's not like it's they're choosing not to go. It's there's so much more that builds into it. It it almost keeps people away. Like, oh, I'm not buying more of this after I just spent this much. Especially if it's so early in the season, right? I'm not. I just spent a couple thousand on season tickets. I'm not spending another hundred to go to a, a single game against a team I don't I don't know, right? Yeah, it's another fair point as well. I'm sure that's playing a factor, <laughs> inclusive of all the other factors that we've talked about. I don't think yeah, there's so- exactly like one overarching reason as to why people aren't showing up. I'm sure it's a plethora of different reasons. Sure. What I guess then in your mind is the path forward. How do we fix this? I don't think I have an answer for that, honestly. I mean, you could try marketing it more, but I just don't think people are going to care about it as much unless you're like really invested in the league. And I just don't think there are enough people at that point that are super invested. I think people are starting to get more invested. You know, they're starting to hear about the league more, whether that's through Messi or through however, Leagues Cup, whatever. Uh, And I think they're starting to build, you know, a stronger bond to a, a certain team or even just the league in general. But I think we're still a ways away from that. So I don't know if the increased marketing would necessarily fix the problem. Quite frankly, I I don't know if there really is a fix. Like I think the earlier rounds, if you're playing against some of the teams that are in like much, much smaller markets, you're probably just not going to draw a big crowd. And I mean, I think it's probably just something that teams at this point will probably start to expect. And once they maybe make it into later rounds and start playing more well-known teams in Mexico or even in the U S I think that's when the attendance will grow a bit more. And I think that's maybe more so where you want to put your effort into trying to get the attendance up. Maybe that's where you put your marketing. Cause that's where I think you can draw people in, but going to watch like a team play from like Haiti or the Dominican Republic, like not saying that they're necessarily bad teams, but they're just not marketable teams that are going to get people off their couches on a Tuesday night to go watch your team play. Yeah, I guess this is where I will disagree here because I think this is the tournament. If you're going to go and like try and market something, being able to market and say, yeah, this tournament, if we win, sets us up to play Real Madrid, sets us up to play Man City possibly, right? Like this is the one we need everybody at to push us all the way, you know, to wherever we're going to go. So the way that I see this being fixed, first of all, as we mentioned, is is the marketing side of it. MLS has sucked at marketing things that aren't Lionel Messi for years. I mean, we in in Red Bull land, we get hyped when we see a Red Bull poster on the subway, right? Like people literally post it in our group, like, oh my God, they're marketing RT. Like on the on the on the B train or whatever train. I don't I don't take the subway. <laughs> um but like that's the level of poor and again it stretches not just to mls but again things that we've covered already in terms of us open cup and now champions cup that there's just a lack of marketing in general they're almost hoping like 
the word of mouth that we do as fans, like pulling people in is going to be enough to do it. And I don't think that's ever the case. You know, you get your, your casual, like few Instagram posts or tweets, but that's not enough to guarantee that those 10,000 casual fans are going to walk through the door. So you need to address that, right? Whether it be a targeted ad on a YouTube video, right? Or, or on Twitter, right? When you're scrolling through and you get all those random ass ads for God knows what, um, you know, that's the stuff that you want to go ahead, do it in between commercial break. You know, when I'm watching Hulu, like if I see a commercial for an MLS game, I'm like, okay, maybe I'm going to, maybe I'm going to consider it, right? Like just different things because whatever they've been doing hasn't been working. The, the, the biggest thing though, for me, and I'll just finish up my, my thought here is going to, I'm going to go back to the, the season ticket thing, right? If you're in the champions league, and you know that you've qualified before you start selling season tickets, the home match of the first round absolutely should be included, right? It's early in the season. People are still considering like, okay, this team, I'm going to, I'm going to try and make all these games. They're going to try their best to go there. And at the very least, like the very least thing, if you sell 10 K season tickets, let's say, right. And 5 K of those people can't go. Maybe they try to resell them. Maybe they hand them off to friends and say, hey, you got nothing going on, you go. So at least instead of losing all 10,000 who aren't going to go, you drop that to maybe you're losing 2,000. And now that stadium is well more packed than it was before, right? That is such an important part of growing this game. You know, I, I always think back to the um, the day we started collecting stories for MLS History Retold, right? People talking about, the random Tuesday night they were out and saw an absolute banger or saw this one, you know, uh, look at Nashville when they played at home this week. Um, Foster, a, a, a Jago, I believe is how you pronounce that name. The dude went off on a brace yet, but he's not able to play in MLS minutes because of international slots. They, they sold them all away. So they can't, they don't have room for him, but you know, people who were looking forward to seeing some of the, some of the kids play and see what they can do when they come up. They don't get to see that now because they weren't there, right? But imagine, right, that night when they smashed Cavalry and, and, and Ajago scored a brace and earned himself, uh, you know, they, they, they made room to, to fit him in there and he's going to be this next bright thing. And I saw him break out and that, that's what hooked me, right? Whatever it may be. But that is something that you, you can't just price people out of because you're not thinking ahead. And that's been really disappointing to me to, I don't want to say all teams, right? St. Louis showed up, Philly showed up, right? But the majority of them are just not seeing this for what it can be. And again, we talk about, somebody tweeted out, and it was a really, really good point, that MLS owners and the commissioner and whoever they are have to always start thinking with this idea of, how do I make them show up and stay forever? This is not how you do that, right? Not having easy access to these types of games, the unique type of games, the different type of games where you're not just going to see another MLS game that may or may not have an impact on, on something going forward, right? But something different. Leagues Cup is something different. U.S. Open Cup is something different. Champions Cup is something different. It, uh, it gives that sort of like fresh revival, I guess, to seeing different games against different teams. And that's the sort of stuff that makes, you know, when, it, when things get repetitive, they get stale. And then people are like, oh, well, I've seen this story one too many times. I'll just watch it at home, right? Just try something different. I'm so, I'm really getting tired of watching this kind of lack of, you know, because I, I think that there's a ton of uh, possibility for people to buy into this stuff, but I don't, I don't think there's enough work from the front office there. I don't know. I've rambled there for a little bit because I kind of got off, but. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously they should try something different because whatever they're doing now is not working. So um, I don't want to, I don't want to harp on the topic too much because I know we still have two other topics to talk about. So. Well, we do have one other thing that I need to build off of and it, it kind of builds off of the last thing I was saying. I, I saw on Twitter that when Messi was announced as the, uh, opponent for and i say messy because that's obviously all their marketing 
for Nashville, their single ticket cost was a third of their entire season ticket package for one ticket. And that's, out. in my opinion, that's absolutely criminal. But I did want to ask you, what are your thoughts on this whole, because I don't think we've really dove into it much. What are your thoughts on this whole abuse the system for messy thing? I mean, I don't agree with it, but it's not something new. We saw it all last season. That was the huge talk of when Messi came over was every single game that Messi was playing in for Miami or I guess technically any game that Miami was playing in once Messi came over, the ticket prices just shot up to the moon. And like it, it was there were conversations of it at the, when it first happened last year. And, it, you know, it looks like it's happening again this year. And I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, I'm, it's a I mean, it, they're they're trying to maximize as much value as they can get out of Messi while he's here. And to some extent, I understand that, but I, I still don't think that it's like the right way to go about it. I mean, you're, you're pricing out people who have been loyal to your team potentially for many years as, or, you know, however many, many years you've been around who supported the team through thick and thin. And now this should be a chance where you reward them, where it's like, okay, you've been good to us. Like, you know, you've been a season ticket holder since the start. Like you've been with us even at our low points. And now here's a high point. You get to see us play against one of the best players to ever play the game. And we're now just going to price everybody out of it because, you know, we want to maximize profits. So uh, I I don't think it's something new. I think it's something that's going to continue to happen. I don't think there's going to be a situation where you're going to fix that. I think it's just going to happen as long as he's here. The few years that he's here, it's probably going to keep happening. Um it sucks. I wish it wasn't happening, but you know, I think that's the the reality of that comes with uh Messi. Messi coming to MLS. So like resale market stuff, I get, right? That's people taking advantage of the of the supply and demand and whatever. But when clubs go out and do something like that, like the, this from what I understand, and I I may be misquoting this because I took you know, I took it off of Twitter and I didn't I should have screen grabbed it and I forgot to. From what it sounds like is this was the season ticket holder, like early access uh, price for these tickets. That's wrong. Just plain and simple, that's wrong. The, as you just mentioned, right, you have these season ticket holders. They've been with you since the start, most of them. And your answer for them to be like thanks for for all your support and now you've got this opportunity to see this world class player is we're going to personally make the decision to charge you three a third of your your season ticket package to go to one game that's wrong and that's where i have my problem with it is when a fan makes that decision to say hey listen here's the supply and demand i've paid you know, the, the ticket came with my season ticket package and people are spending, you know, up to half of what my season tickets were. Some some of them got, got their whole season tickets paid for. Right. That's one thing, because that's a that's a per, like an individual. You don't have to buy from there. But when the club comes out and is like, yeah, we are going to just milk it for all it's worth. I think that's poor in taste because it goes back to this idea of. How do you bring fans in and keep them here long term, right? That's not how you do that. That's how you send most of them away. When you got people who are like, I'm willing to give you my money to come up and support you and be a part of what you're doing and and all of this good stuff, right? I, I could go on forever about it. And your answer to them is, hey, we we really appreciate you, but we are going to prioritize the people who are going to spend dumb amounts of money to come here instead like that's wrong and this is where the people you know anti-mls crowd doesn't have a lot of legs to stand on this one i can get behind with that. like that is the wrong way to go about it if you're looking to build a proper support network right like if you look at the people who have been around this this whole time and you say yep we're gonna make a decision that that benefits us monetarily over over the long term where you're going to, you know, we'll make 200% profit on, on these tickets. 
but we're also going to lose all of you guys from supporting, you know, day in and day out. You know, not all of you, right? But a, a percentage of you, they're not thinking long term, they're thinking short term. And that's a problem for me. Like, we're at a point in our league's history where we need to be long term focused, right? Short term focus was really good when we needed to survive. We will survive. Like we are fine. We are set in the in the global game. Like we've got our infrastructure. We're fine. Now you have to start thinking about the long term. And this is a very short term idea. And I'm I, I don't like it. And I and I didn't like it when they did it last season too. But that was mainly the the aftermarket resale, not um, the club making the decision. And that's my problem is when the club does it. Well, I mean, they probably didn't plan it ahead of time to maximize their prices last year because there wasn't a certainty that Messi was going to come here. But, uh, I, you know, I, I, like I said before, I don't want to harp on the topic too much because we have more stuff to talk about, but you know, I, again, I don't think it's the right way for them to do things, but at the same time, you know, just to throw on a, a question for you on your point, how much of a percentage do you think is just going to fully boycott their support of Nashville over this? Like, I, I can't see it being a high percentage that say, okay, I can never support this team again because of this. No, I don't think it's a high percentage, but my, like the way I think about it is the, there are two, two types of people I'm I'm worried about, right? It's the people who just got in for the first year thinking, oh man, we're going to get all these perks. And then they, that happens to them. They might not renew next year. They'll they'll still buy tickets and watch games on TV and whatever, but may, they might not renew next year. And then the other one is the the casual fan who is looking forward to showing up for a couple games, and then they're like, "Oh, let me see what these these prices are going to be." And they're like, "Oh, three hundred dollars for a ticket? I'm not going to that." And then they just stop looking at it. Right? I don't think it's a big percentage, but long term right over the course of whatever it's taking your, if your potential to grow year over year is 10% year over year, right? You might've just cut that down to six. And now our, our exponential growth is lower. I think exponential is probably the wrong word there, but my brain's all scienced out from the last week. So um, it, it just, it's, it's wrong in terms of like the sporting ideology of it and the things that um, kind of, make the game special in in that way i don't know it just it just sits wrong with me that's all that's all i'm saying i mean to our point before don't know how many of the first year fans or casual fans really know about champions cup or care about champions cup so i i think we're talking about a really small percentage of people that would look at this and be like all right i probably won't come back to this and look at potential prices later down the line. Uh, So, I mean, again, I still think it's the wrong thing for them to do, but I don't think we're talking about long-term effects being impacted, like any teams being impacted on long-term effects. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. We'll let the comments jump on in and let us know what they think because um, we could, we could go on and, and go into super depth about this for the next hour or so but no need for that but what we should do is we should flip-flop coasts we've been talking a lot about the east coast teams and now it's probably time to go over the west coast because rumors are dropping that a longtime lafc winger and current record holder for the most goals in a season carlos vela is heading to san jose on a dp deal in a shocking move that comes just days after a report surfaced that Vela still hadn't cleaned out his locker from the LAFC facility with hopes of a return. What do you think of the move? If it, the alleged move, because it hasn't been announced yet. Uh, quite frankly, not a big fan of it. I think San Jose's starting lineup was already in a good spot. We talked about this in our deep dive, and we talked about this in the, the season previews. I thought their starting 11 is really strong. Don't think they needed to go and use a DP spot to bring in somebody to to fill a position that I feel like they already filled in the offseason with Pellegrino. But they did it anyway. I feel like the focus should have been on getting depth for this team because I think they're really thin. I mean, we're talking about a 35-year-old Vela 
who, you know, favorite term, wrong side of 30, he's only going to get older. His numbers are not where they once were in his early days of LAFC. They were still pretty decent, you know, the last couple of years. I'm not going to say they were bad. He still had 21 goal contributions in 2022 and 16 in 2023. Like, he will still get you goal contributions. I'm sure of it. My question is, you know, partially how much of that was the benefit of the LAFC system? We'll surely find that out because San Jose is not the same system as LAFC. That is a certainty. Um, and, you know, what's he going to like? How much does he still have in the tank? I mean, he's he's 35 at this point, like he's getting up there. It's a it's a risky DP move, whereas I feel like they could have sat on it, waited to see until the summer. You know, let's see if there's a, a huge hole that you notice in the team that you feel you need to fill or a key player goes down with an injury like Christian Espinosa goes down with a season ending injury and you have an open DP spot. Now you can go and like bring somebody in. But um, or I maybe Espinosa is a bad example because Vela could be that guy to come in. But let's just say it's like, uh, I don't know, Rodriguez in center back. You know, come keeping on. that this, flexibility. This is a team that you pick to be elite, and you can't remember one name. <laughs> I was just trying to think of somebody outside of the attack, but uh, let's just say he goes down with an injury, right? Like having that flexibility, it's at having a DP spot open. Now you can go bring in basically anybody you want to come in and fill that role and keep this team hunting for the playoffs and hunting for trophies and all that. But um, I don't know off the top of my head, if they have any other DP spots open, I can't remember. I'd imagine Espinosa is on one and Bell is obviously on another. And I can't remember if they have a third could be Gureza. Gureza. I hear yeah. Yeah. It's so Gureza. now, now they're, now they're stuck and you lose that flexibility. So, uh, I don't think Vale is a bad player, and I'm sure Vale is going to get them 10 plus goal contributions if he gets the game time. But I just, I'm not a fan of the move. I, I think they have other needs that they needed to address first. And I think the flexibility would have been a beneficial thing for them. And I think they should have been a little bit more patient with using that last DP spot. See, this is why I know Ball and you are my co host, because this is a great move. This, you know, yes, he's over 30. He's on the wrong side of 30, but he's one of those over 30s that can still contribute a very good amount. Nine goals, six assists last season, second consecutive MLS Cup final. And we did talk about the roster makeup of this side. And what did we talk about in this attacking group? We talked about the fact that they've got a good starting and their depth isn't super great. So I expect Vela to be a starter. But even if he isn't, imagine taking this guy off the bench and, and being an impact 20, 25-minute guy. I don't think that's going to be the case because I do see him being used in a different way, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. But giving yourself that many options instead of just relying on the Red Bull model of, we're going to have a good starting 11. If somebody gets hurt, which kid's up next? That's not the way you want to go about this. I like the move. I think he has he still has a good amount to give and he's he's a different player to what they have. Like Espinosa really good on the you know the drive. He's very good at going at players and Jabo very strong in the air. Pellegrino looks to be more of a, a striker. Vela can be a different type of guy, a creative player if you will. They don't really have a number 10. I know we talked about Sakaris maybe being that guy, but do you want to roll the dice with Espinosa, Pellegrino, Jabo and then somebody you're not super confident can create that that final pass for them? Or do you want to go with somebody who has shown it for the last six and a half, seven seasons that he can be that guy? I like the move. I think it's a really good – he's one of the guys that I think if you have an open DSP spot and he's looking around, you use it on. I think it's a, I think it's a good move. I'm sure so, San Jose fans are not going to like me saying that it's – that I don't think it's a good move, but I just think that – I mean, we've seen him play in the league for many years, but we've seen him play in one system that is known for its excellent attack. I, I, I'm, I, I really just am skeptical of what he will look like in a new system because I saw it with Josef Martinez, and it's a little bit of a different situation because he had an injury that he was coming back from, but he was in that super high attacking Atlanta system, and he looked amazing. He was putting up the same numbers as Vela. He was scoring at the same even like time frame as Vela. Like it was, they were elite at the same time. And then 
he goes, he moves on to Miami, and it did not work out at all. Like it was, it was a really bad move for him. He just did not fit well in there. I just wouldn't be shocked to see that happen again here. If Vela moves to San Jose, I, it's not the same LAFC system. It's going to be something new, and I'm not sure that he's the right piece to put in there. So out of curiosity, you know the last person to switch from a high-powered LAFC team to a relatively okay Western Conference team in the attacking? Chicho Aranjo. Chicho Aranjo, thank you. Chicho Aranjo last season, six goals, one assist in 764 minutes. This season, he's already got a goal in 176 minutes. Like Chicho's not 35. Players, players who can play will play. That's That's it. Like, ballers ball. Are Carlos you saying then, Yosef's not a baller then? Post injury, Yosef, we've gone over it many times. Post injury, Yosef was not a baller. 35 year old healthy Carlos Vela is a baller. Now, the question that I have for you is what role? Because I, I mean, you, you can come back with whatever argument you want from that. It will be wrong, and we don't need to waste time on you, you know, giving me bad, bad takes, right? So, how do you think Carlos Vela is used in this system? Is he going to bump somebody to the bench? Is he going to be on the bench? Are they going to change um, shape? What do, what do you see from this group? No, you don't bring in a designated player to sit on the bench. He, he's coming in to be a starter. He's, in my opinion, will be on the wing, probably in place of Kakanovic or Pellegrino, whoever ends up getting that other starting wing spot. Uh, and him... Uh, Jabo and Espinosa will be the, the trio of attacking wingers. I know you're going to say that he's going to be the number 10 for them because you already kind of hinted at it, but I just don't think that that's his role. I don't think he's necessarily a playmaker. I think he's a goal scorer. I don't think he's the guy that's like a Carl's heel type of guy that's going to link the attack and make all these things happen. And I don't think he's a bad playmaker, but his numbers weren't exactly like off the charts in terms of like progressive like carries on the ball and passes like his passing completion percentage out of attacking mids and wingers was 37th percentile like that that's you can't have your attacking playmaker in the 37th percentile of passing like i i just don't think that's his role in the team i think he will be out on the wing with espinosa and abobasi and i think that's great that's a, a great attacking trio um, yeah, again, th this is why you, you, you can't just go by numbers with certain players, right? Because we're going off vibes, we're going off, we're going off the way that they play and the way that their, their game looks. I don't think that he's bumping anybody to the bench. And I agree with you that I don't see this being a, a DP off the bench type of signing because that's just not something you do so i agree with you there what i see is him playing next to jeremy abobasi i see him being a second number nine with pellegrino and espinoza next to each other and while jabo either runs in behind or becomes a high target he's gonna fall off underneath and he's either gonna pick up the second ball and make that decisive pass pass which he absolutely has the ability to do or he's going to allow Jabo to be the high target. He's just going to sneak underneath him. They're going to play into Jabo. He's going to lay it off into them, and then he's going to hit Pellegrino. He's going to hit Espinoza in uh, in transition there. Now, what that also allows them to do then is, if Pellegrino or Espinoza need to come out, he can shift to that role. And when he shifts to that role, then you can bring in somebody like a Sakaris, if you want to give him a chance to create, or you can bring in more defensive help and allow him to just kind of be in open space and create a bunch of chances and kind of just take people one-on-one -on -one in, in the late stage of the game from there. There are a lot of things that you can do with this, this move. And I think it very much will be uh, a two striker partnership with him being more of a false nine than a true, like, proper number nine, which is what he did in LAFC, by the way, which is where he got a lot of those um, goals. So. so you think they go four in the attack is what you're saying? Double striker and two wingers with Pellegrino and Espinosa. Yeah, so so you're going to, you're really, it'll still stay to be a four, two, three, one, realistically, with 
Vela having the freedom to either drop into the 10 or go up to be a, a, a proper nine. So uh, that is that is the way I, I, I would have run it if I'm in charge here. And again, I'm not because, you know, I'm just one of those un, undiscovered talents in the coaching world. But um, that's the way I would I would see this happening. It's a it's an interesting take, I'd say, to say the least. I, I feel like that's putting a lot of that's putting a lot of faith in in Jackson Ewell, I think, to be your your link between the defense and the attack, because somebody's got to be the guy to kind of filter the ball through from the defense to the attack, unless you're saying that Vela is just going to drop that far down to collect the ball and, and link link things up. How dare you not have faith in our U23 captain, Jackson Ewell, center back Jackson Ewell. How dare you? That's that's Jackson Ewell's best role is linking the play, in my opinion, right? Like when they ask him to be the, the lone six, he's not that much of a destroyer. They put Gruezo next to him. Now he can link the play. They ask him to be a center back. He's not a center back, right? I think that's his best role. And when you put somebody like Carlos Vela in front of him, it makes his job stupid easy. Pick up the ball and kick it to the good guy. Great. Good job. You did it. Like it's not, it's not hard. I, I could do it if I had, if I had the ability to, but my ability is a little bit higher level, you know? Um, but if you're, if you're another team now, like you got to think the mentality is okay. San Jose gets the ball. You got one guy on the field that you got to pressure and then the ball's not getting up to the attack. And then San Jose just is kind of stuck there. Like I, I think, Ewell's a, a pretty good passer. Just like looking at the numbers from last year, he, he ranked really well in the passing game, but his in terms of his like carries and his take ons and his touches, like he's low. He's not great. He's a little bit below average. And so that to me says if this guy gets the ball, just surround him as like fast as you can. And then the attack's not getting the ball. Yeah, that that's a lot easier said than done, right? Like the transition from attack to defense with that much focus and, and intensity is something you need to train for forever. Red Bull will do that well, but Red Bull don't play against them. They're a, the, the team that will succeed the most in doing that is St. Louis, right? Because that's Bradley Carnell's Red Bull Jr., right? But other teams who, who don't high press as, as frequently will struggle with that, and that's going to give them openings and, and spaces, right? And the other outside part is, right, like it's not just those front seven. Those wing players are very, very strong. The, the center backs are good in possession. Like it, it's a good group. So I I love the signing. I think that they, if if you want to get all of them on together, you do that. And that's one way you can do that. But I want to know, I had San Jose missing the playoffs. You had them in the playing game. Does this ch- signing change any of that for you? I got San Jose eighth. Like you said, playing game. I think they're, they're, comfortably ahead of the teams in my opinion that are behind them in my standings i don't think they're i mean obviously i don't think adding carlos vela is gonna put them in a situation where they fall below the teams below them but in terms of them moving up i honestly don't see them moving much further up i think maybe with the addition of vela they could jump up to seventh and get out of the playing game and just straight into the playoffs but i don't see them skyrocketing up like the western conference i don't see them being like top five now because they brought in Bella. I will agree with that. I don't see them jumping all the way, you know, into a, a home playoff game per se. Um, but I do have, I, I do, I can see them jump kind of to where you, you got, you have them now, like that eight, nine, maybe even seven range. The bottom of the West is not as strong as, you know, and we've talked about this. It's not super duper strong, Right. A signing like Carlos Vela, depending on no matter how you use him, can be a difference in five games this season between being zero points or one point or one point to three points. Those differences will jump you spots to get you either into the playoffs, out of the play in game, you know, that sort of uh, move. And that's kind of what I see happening with this team. I can see it less of you know, oh my God, this is going to be the 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 best team in the West now. And more of a, hey, we've got a difference maker that can go and change the game on his own and win us a point or win us two points. That'll jump us a spot, right? Or separate the distance between us and the, la- the, the guy below us, right? That's kind of where I see this signing putting them. 
uh, which means they're probably going to finish top of the West based off of the way or I predict. bottom top or <laughs> based bottom <laughs> based off of the way I predict stuff. Right. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should change mine actually. Now that you said that, now that you said it's going to be around where I think they'll be. Can you can you actually just change yours? Can you say that they're going to finish top? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right. Uh that's Carlos Vela to San Jose. We've got one more section here we want to chat about. Uh as we mentioned, goodness me guys, we're already a week into the season. We should see four coaches fired already. It's hot seat time. Who's on the hot seat? As we head into, and I don't care that people call it week three right now. It's week two. As we head into week two, uh, who are we talking about being in the hot seat? I know you have a couple more than I do, so I'll let you go first. Now, yes. just remember, just remember that this is not an opinionated thing. You can be wrong here, and Connor will be evidently wrong on some of these. Well, because you know who like one of my picks is. And, I don't uh... know anything. I'll start I'll start off with him so you can get it out of the way but I I said it in the preseason and he proved it in week 1. I'm not a fan of Chris Armis. I think he was the wrong signing for Colorado. He lost 4 to 1 against Neville who plenty of people think is also not a good coach. Not a great look, not a great start. I think he's got an uphill battle. I don't necessarily think that like his seat is burning hot right now, but I personally, I had thoughts that he would struggle. Um, it's only week one, but I feel like he's kind of already starting to tilt towards that track. So I don't think his seat is burning hot. I think it's a little toasty. Um, and if he doesn't get it, if he doesn't turn things around, it, granted, it's only one game again. But if he doesn't turn things around, I think his seat will only get warmer and warmer because the the organization a team not known for spending much finally broke out the checkbooks and brought in a lot of good players i don't know if they're going to be in a situation where they're going to be super patient after that and so uh i will see how long of a leash he gets i mean frazier was there for a long time so they could be pretty good about supporting their head coaches the other one i'll kind of just knock out too oh, no, because... no, no, no. Freeze, freeze, freeze. all right we're switching back and forth or you got bots you got to bring in yeah you, you ever you ever heard of the podcast the basement yard I think so. Yeah, Joe Joe, and uh, I don't know the other guy. Um, Joe was like a famous YouTuber. He, he went. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you know how like there's always Joe being like the rat just talking about stuff. And the other guy's like, I've never heard of a BLT before. And they're like, oh, my God, you're insane. <laughs> like, this is what this clip is about to be. You're going to sit here and tell me after a single game with a brand new starting 11. That this coach is just needs to be gone like well i've said that before he even started one game yeah again because you don't know ball like you don't get it like you just have zero do i, do I not get it so that's let's, let's ask the toronto fans that watched him when he was in charge if they get it you're acting like i didn't watch him like what are you stop it then you should know you should know so, what what you're telling me is that the other one of the other coaches on your list is Caleb Porter in New England because he's a new we coach. We talked with about a, this. It's he's with not a new starting. Oh, he's a new coach with a new starting eleven who lost his first game. So by that logic, he's got to go. His team had a red card in twenty five. Oh, minutes. there we go. And, and Porter has two MLS cups to his name. What does Chris Armas have? Um, what does Chris Armas have? Just multiple stints in Europe. Yeah, like that doesn't. Happen. <laughs> I don't. I just on vacation. <laughs> I don't need to hear this this nonsense and this garbage of not understanding like the window of adjustment in in these sorts of of environments, right? Like you've got a group of a bunch of players that we said in our preview that is going to take time to gel. Like that was the big question a bunch of us had: is how long is it going to take to gel? And that's going to determine things. But never once do we say, if Chris Armas can't get it to gel within 90 minutes of the season starting, he's got to go, brother. Like, that's not how this works. I didn't say he had to go right this second. First of all, I said he had to go before the season even started. I did not like his appointment at all. I made that clear. Um, I don't think he gets sacked anytime soon. Like, I, I seriously, I don't. I don't think he, I don't think he gets, like, fired within the first at least 15, 20 games. But I'm just using this as an opportunity to once again spread my displeasure of him being in charge of Colorado. 
That's all. That's all. I'm just taking this as an opportunity because you handed you're it to using me. It as an opportunity to advance your garbage agenda. That's what you're doing. <laughs> so what I'll what I'll say is this is Connor's BLT moment, and I think that's really exciting for him. He'll get to look I don't back. Think that's on my this. BLT moment. He'll get to look back on this and be like, "Wow, I don't know anything." It's great. I can't wait. I'll look back on this when Colorado is in like 13, 20 games of the season because they can't get their system to work under Chris Armas and I'll look like a genius. You'll look like something. That's for sure. Let Um, me let me get my other one out of the way, because I think we're going to have the same last two. Uh, And my my other one is is Peter Vermees, because that was my bold prediction. So I kind of just have to stick by my bold prediction here. And say that his seat is warm. Um, I don't. I mean, obviously, week one, it wasn't like he went out and had a stinker, right? Like it was a one-one draw. Like he's not gonna have his seat on fire after one game. But um, I mean, I think his seat was already a little bit warm coming in from last season. So unless he kind of shows that this team has like the potential to be a playoff team this year, I think his seat will stay a bit warm. I lose brain cells every time I talk to you. I swear to God. <laughs> like you can, you can still keep your bold prediction and not say dumb stuff in this segment. Like, you know that, right? Like there was no obligation for me to be like, Oh yeah. Like I said that in the beginning of the season, that by the end of the season, that this coach would be, would be gone. So I'm going to say that he's on a hot seat. Like that. What nobody required that to happen. Like, I just want to put I, that out. I don't think, listen, we're talking about hot seats one game into a season. Like, what do you want me to do? Like, nobody is in a situation where they're getting fired tomorrow. There are absolutely coaches that are on the hot seat right now, but those two are not them. Nobody is getting fired tomorrow. None of them are. We're We're one game into the season. Nobody is getting, like, you are going to go at least, at at the very minimum, you're going to go five games into the season before anybody's even truly on the hot seat we're talking about hot seat one game into the season what do you want from me i'm i'm doing my best to give you content and pick players or <laughs> sorry pick coaches is. This, is just, this is just a content bruise you don't believe any of this so that's the way i'm going to spin this so i don't have to break <laughs> into your house and take your glasses and snap that's what i would do if i were with you right now vancouver still hasn't even played a game yet and we're talking about coaches on the hot seat it's ridiculous. Yeah. what do you want me to do <laughs> I want you to not be dumb and recognize that there are only two names that we need to talk about. The first one belongs to the baseball team at NYCFC, and it's Nick Cushing. Nick Cushing, the question that we all asked at the beginning of our, our not or at the end of our not so deep dives, is he the right man for the job? How long is the leash for him to figure it out? Last season, they couldn't figure out how to turn draws into wins, right? They were tied with San Jose for the most draws in MLS during 2023. They missed the playoffs because of it. Uh, and Fans all over were, were questioning the sub patterns and his game management. He also went a long time without having a true nine. This season, he's got all the attacking talent in the world, it seems, with infinite young, exciting wingers, a couple of solid number nines. Uh, he scored the second lowest amount of goals last year, and he starts off the season with a one nothing loss to Charlotte, where his team generated the third least uh, XG in the league last uh, last week. Against an average back line, by the way. This wasn't like a Red Bull. You know, Nashville was bottom, but they played Red Bull, who are just a defensive juggernaut. This was Charlotte. It's pretty clear that he's been given the tools to do this and get this right, uh, and he needs to prove it. And I would not be shocked if he's the first man out the door in 2024 relatively soon, because this isn't like a, oh, Chris Armas had one bad game and we're going to get rid of him now. This is a, he's been here for a year and a half, and just no, no ideas, right? Clueless. So... He's on the hot seat for me. And yeah, that's a legitimate hot seat pick. Listen, if you think Cushing's getting the sack earlier than five games into the season, I think you're crazy. No, I'm not and, saying and that. It, I'm it, saying that he's on the hot seat, though. Okay, but how do you call it a hot Like, how many games or, or how many games out does somebody... I can't, I can't think of the right way to say this. But... Let, let's be real. Let's be, and I just said this. Let's be realistic. This isn't him having a bad start to a season. This is him having a year and a half of bad results that are still not <laughs> turning around. No matter how. But I, many... I said that about Vermees, and you gave me you gave me crap about it. He he wasn't even he he barely scraped into the playoffs last year. Oh, ba- barely scraped into the play. He didn't have three DPS. They were all hurt. 
<laughs> yeah. What do you mean? The, the second he gets them back, they go on the the hottest streak in MLS, and they get themselves in the playoffs. They knock out the number one seed. They make a run, and they get knocked out by a team. I think they lost to LA, didn't they? They lost to Houston. They lost to Houston, who won the U.S. Open Cup and were legitimate in that tournament. Like, don't tell me that, oh, Peter Vermees was the same way, because Peter Vermees had actual extenuating circumstances. Nick Cushing had nothing. Like, he just had a good team. He couldn't figure out how to make it work. There are there are levels to this. Do we want to Who's talk your... about do we do we want to talk about where SKC was in the year before that then? No. Because they also were missing players. Anyways, give me your next player because I'm tired of this. Um okay, so I also had Cushing, so I'll skip over that one. Uh the other one I had was Josh Wolf for Austin. And and Austin's kind of a really I think it's a tough situation because I think the roster is kind of garbage. But I think evidently, considering where they were last year and where I think we're looking at him going this year, would not be surprised to see him get canned at some point early on in the season. But do I think that's the right decision? I'm not too sure. I'm not sure someone could come in and really right the ship on this one. I think Austin's in need of a rebuild. And uh, I don't think they put that in motion this offseason. I don't think they worked their way towards a rebuild. I think they brought in more aging players to try to solve the problem now. So I also have Josh Wolf. So you're you're two for four. That's good. You're you're fifty percent. That's great. Um li- listen, he had a he had a really good 2022 season. He came back in 2023 missed the playoffs by five points and had a magnificent loss to Haitian side Violette in the Champions League. This season, he starts off the comeback trail with a 2-1 loss to a Minnesota team with no head coach and missing two of their best attackers. The way I see Josh Wolf is this, is if these losses add up, the ones that they think they should be winning, you know, they've got a, they've got a good squad. But if the losses add up that they should be winning, it's going to be really, really tough to keep the locker room content and from boiling over. Somebody's going to put it together that the coach isn't getting it done, and the only way to save this is to to switch things up. right? I think Josh Wolf has done a great job in in Austin, building them, getting them to where they were in 2022. But kind of like Adrian Heath in Minnesota last year, like there are are just limited teams and how good coaches can get them to be. And sometimes you just need new ideas and a new face, and that might be Josh Wolf. So... Yeah, it's I mean, warm, I think, baby. I th- I think, I think he, if he had not had his 2022 season with Austin, he's probably gone after last season. Agreed. Last season was a wreck for them. I mean, it was really, really bad. Um, I I feel like at this point, 2022 is starting to look more like the outlier and not the uh the commonality here. I think he maybe just got the most out of his team and. Maybe it's just that the roster is just not that good. Uh, you know, I, I think we, that's kind of, I feel like the consensus we came to when we were talking about them preseason, like it's just not a great roster. Well, we'll leave that up to discussion for our, our listeners and our supporters. So um, thanks everybody for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Hopefully Connor will be done relatively soon uh, with his, what is it? Job. So let me Job. Yeah, is that what you have? I, I don't know. I thought you were talking about Jude Bellingham's brother. <laughs> that is such a weird connection. I well, his know. name is Job. <laughs> is it really? I didn't know that. Yeah, I was trying to. I was trying to insinuate your big boy job, where uh, it ties you up for like a hundred hours a week. Because um, eventually, we're going to start getting to uh, MLS history retold again. We're going to start bringing those stories back. So. If you liked what we do here, we do this every Monday. We'll do MLS history on Wednesday and our games on Friday. They keep coming out. So make sure you stick around for those as well. Uh, Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You know uh, when it goes live, we'll get a little alert. Follow us on Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, and then Facebook and Instagram as well. We're all over the place, but those first three are where we're most active. Uh, We're really excited. We got a lot of really good stuff coming. uh, And MLS news never seems to stop breaking. So we'll never have fun stuff not to talk about. Uh, and I got if some do... breaking news right now for you to end the episode. How about that? Oh, word? What happened? Tom Bogert, 37 minutes ago, Portland making a $15 million bid for Berterame out of Monterey. Oh, the, the Monterey striker. Yep. 
That's huge. Well, 15 mil. That's huge. That's, that's big a, money. That's, a, that's big. That's big Portland money, man. That's, I mean, Evander was 10. They're, they're throwing another 50% on top of that. That's wild. So a good spot though. Strikers, a, a position of need for them. I feel like looks like we might Portland be looking dangerous. If that goes through, looks like we might be, uh, we already have a topic that we'll be talking about next week. So, <laughs> um, stick around if you want to hear our thoughts on those moves and all the other moves. Um, Follow us wherever you get your podcast, and we will see you next time on the next episode of the Designated Players and MLS podcast. See ya.